welcome back everyone um, to the first school committee meeting of the school year. It's Thursday, September 12th, and this is, I'm Len Carden, chair of the Arlington School Committee. Um, tonight we're going to open with artwork. We have artwork to tonight from the Monotomy Preschool. Uh, starting with, on my left, preschool went to the zoo. Preschool one went to the zoo. Uh, this year we spent a week learning about the zoo. We read multiple books and listened to a variety of songs focusing on our zoo time. For art, we made panda bears out of construction paper, pom-poms and eyeballs. We made horses, which the kids painted with blue paint and eyeballs. We made gorillas with the kids marble painted with brown paint. Marble painting involves the kids putting their artwork in a box and rolling around a marble so it moves all the paint around the paper. Lastly, we made elephants, which the kids painted using puffy paint, which is a mixture of glue and shaving cream. The kids really enjoyed learning about the zoo, and it even prompted some kids to visit the zoo with their families. Uh, e is the next step back there. Mm -hmm. Okay, the very busy spider, the preschool seven class, at, which is at the Pierce School, read Eric Carl's mm -hmm. classic story, The Very Busy Spider, about a spider who didn't have time to play with the other animals on the farm because she was so busy spinning her web. We had fun saying the sounds the animals in the story make, and talked about how we all have to get our work done first and then we can play. In the end, the spider's hard work plays off when she catches the pesky fly just like that in her web. Please notice how each child was given the same materials and each created a unique piece of art. Uh, e on the right side, still back in the back of board E, was preschool five. Our classroom made a version of Old MacDonald Had a Farm. After reading the book and listening to the song, we asked students to choose their own animals to decorate. We provided students with a variety of materials such as markers, crayons, tissue paper, foam shapes, pom-poms, and bingo daubers in colors that match their animal. We also had a group of students decorate their barn to practice taking turns and sharing materials in space. And back behind Karen on the left side is under the sea. Students in our class, this is preschool six, have been learning about the ocean. They made different kinds of ocean animals to put on our, our background. The background is made from painting with a scraper to make it look like the bottom of the ocean and waves. We also cut cardstock to make it look like seaweed. Our ocean animals include fish, crabs, starfish, and seahorses. On the right side of board A is preschool two. They read The Artist Who Painted a Blue Horse by Eric Carle. This book is based on Frank Mark's famous painting, Blue Horse. After hearing the story read aloud, students made animals in different colors and styles. And back behind, over here, B is Pond Life. Preschool three children learned about Pond Life this spring. We had an extensive book collection of fiction and nonfiction books created by librarians at the Children's Room at Little Robin's Library. The children's played in a pond in our water table, complete with pond creatures and lily pads. During the unit, the children used materials to create their own unique interpretations of flora and fauna around a pond. C, back there. Um, last one, at preschool four, we spent a lot of time this year talking about what makes us special, kind, and good friends to one another. In the beginning of the year, we read books, Be Who You Are and It's Okay to Be Different, both by Todd Parr, and created our own versions of our self-portraits given a choice of different colors and shapes of paper. We repeated the exercise at the end of the year after reading friendship stories such as Llama Llama Time to Share by Anna Dudney and Rainbow Fish by Marcus Fister. The students had an opportunity to dictate a description of the illustration and we transcribed it for them to accompany their work. These reflect different levels of awareness of themselves and others as captured with their own words and interpretation. Congratulations to all our preschool artists. Thank you for brightening our room. There does not appear to be any public comment. All right. So we'll move on to the first uh, agenda item. And thank you, Chris, for showing up early. <laughs> uh, uh, Jennifer, do, do you want to present um, uh, sure. Chris? Um, so the, the agenda item is appointment to the Arlington Human Rights Commission. Um, the school committee has two or three 
Uh, we have at least four. Oh, four. All right. Total. Thank you. Uh, to the Arlington four. Human no, Rights five. Commission. Five. Sorry. Five. five. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So. So thank you. Uh, so you might remember last spring when we made an appointment, um, we talked about the embarrassment of riches that we had um, in the applicant pool, and um, there were actually many strong candidates. And um, unfortunately for Chris, he, uh, we chose someone else at that time, but he was very, very clearly our second choice. And so um, when there was another opening, he, um, he was a natural choice to, to, to have. So thank you very much. Um, he comes highly recommended. Um, he's been very active in town, but I'll have you t talk about yourself. Oh, yeah, you need to talk into the yeah, yeah, microphone. Into mic. You can stand. You just need to talk in there. <laughs> First, I want to thank the subcommittee for its confidence and for the uh, nomination and the recommendation to the full committee. Thank you to the full committee because I'm sitting here with no other applicants. So it makes me feel really good. <laughs> I have um, been involved in human rights and social justice for really my entire adult life. It's a passion that I have. Oh. And we're not getting you. I don't think this is moved closer. How's that, there? <laughs> you can move the. You mic. can move. Oh, just so move the mic. The thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> How's that? Testing, testing. Go for it. Yeah. Are you bringing up a controversial so, okay, subject? This is for Daniel 124 Parkinson. No sir, Mr. Schmidt. All good news tonight. Okay, so let's not talk about testing, and we'll talk about human rights and uh, cool things like that. Sure. So I've been involved with human rights and social justice in a number of forms and shapes. Organizationally, mostly at the community level for most of my life, from college, beginning with the AIDS Action Committee and many of the early LGBTQ um, initiatives. Uh, remember that uh, if you look at my resume, you'll see I was uh, graduating from high school in Matthew College in 1981 at the height of the AIDS epidemic. Since then, I have found many avenues uh, to express myself, uh, both um, you know, at the community level as an activist and community organizer. Most recently I have focused, uh, many of you know that uh, 11 years ago now, my husband and I adopted an African-American boy, which has created a family that you know, is filled with challenges, uh, you know, being a same-sex family with an African-American son. <clears throat> so I have dived in and studied and worked very hard in lots of issues that have affected us and other families that look like us, particularly racial justice, you know, the issues of equity, uh, racial equality, and, you know, the issues that those of us who are blessed with white privilege, who live in affluent places like Arlington, now are being called to address. And uh, I have uh, observed the Human Rights Commission here in Arlington have been very, very impressed with its work and have gotten to know several of the members. And about a year ago, I began to think that this was a good place for me to do my community service that I've always valued uh, here, uh, right here in this community. And so that brought me to your uh, doorstep. And I'm very pleased to be here. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Does the committee have any questions? I'm just going to make it proud to make the motion uh, to appoint Chris Lamayo to uh, Great. Second. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Thank you for w being willing to serve. We really appreciate it. Thank you all. It's a lot of work to do. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. We haven't voted yet. It's not <laughs> like to dismiss Mr. Chairman. No, we have to vote. <laughs> have to vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Unanimous. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I you learned a long time ago to, to, to now stop, now stop, stop arguing when they approve. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving right along, we'll go to the opening day update from Dr. Modi. Thank you. Um, I'll just start by saying it was a very smooth opening in all of our schools this year. Um, Hiring. It's always hard to, take, to come back from the summer and begin, begin the school year, but uh, it went very well. And, I, and this is the second year we've also done um, uh, this kind of an opening for kindergartners where they had open house on Tuesday 
then half the class came on Wednesday, the other half on Thursday, and the full class on Friday. And after being around a number of kindergarten um, classrooms, they've all said this has worked very well. So I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that that is the case. And they are quite adorable, watching them get used to being in school, lining up, walking down to the lunchroom, all of those things as they practiced uh, the, the routines of being in school. So it went very well uh, in opening day, but actually for teachers, uh, this, the opening really was the previous Wednesday when we had um, all of the teachers, staff, everyone in the auditorium. And when you were in the auditorium, it was actually looked pretty full. And I'll thank Mr. Cardin for coming and, uh, and having an opening welcome uh, which were very well received. Uh, and, and on that day, we talked about um, the, a number of things, including our vision of student as learner and global citizen, and what does that mean in your own classroom? How do, how do you begin, you know, how do you help students to move toward this vision of what, what disposition, skills, and knowledge they will have when they leave the Arlington Public Schools? You know, we also, I also talked about um, you know, really what is the focus of this year in just terms of big themes around our district goals. And you know, one of them, as you all know, is aligning our curriculum to be uh, very, cons very um, consistent with uh, the, the, um, the, the new standards that uh, have been promulgated by the Department of Education, including one which uh, I know that um, Mr. Levy, who is here with us tonight, uh, president of the AEA, knows that we're, we've changed our whole eighth grade curriculum around the new standards for civics. So th that's, we'll talk more about that this evening, some of the, cr the major curriculum initiatives, but then also the work that we will continue to do uh, for in uh, making our schools much more um, aligned with good social emotional practices in our classroom, uh, continuing our own development for cultural proficiency, and you know, using opportunities more and more for student choice so that uh, students can um, learn self-efficacy, independence, which is, is certainly part of the vision. So those were some of the highlights that we started with, and then there was, a, there, teachers spent a lot of time uh, in curriculum updates. Again, we'll, we'll talk about some of those um, a little bit later. But um, all in all, all the preparation that goes in and during the summer, which is extensive, really, really uh, pays off when you can have such a, a smooth opening. And it's continued that way, except for, of course, as you know, the one glitch of Eversource, um, we're losing power at the Odyssey. <laughs> these things happen. Um, but at any rate, other than that, as we've gone forward, it's been, it's been terrific. Um, it actually might not be such a good uh, bad idea right now to talk a little bit about some of these big curriculum initiatives. And before um, Dr. McNeil talks about that, I, I'd like to say one of the things that is uh, different this year, and there's a number of things, is the elementary schedule. Um, thanks to the, the uh, increase in funding to the school budget and with the operating override in June, we have for the very first time been able to have dedicated um, art and music specialists in our elementary schools. The significance of that is that it really frees up us being able to schedule time differently. Before we were, uh, elementary principals are sort of subject to scheduling basically when they could get their specialist. Not all schools have a 1.0 their building, but they have somebody that's, that's exclusively in that building. And one of the, uh, ben there are a number of benefits from that, which I, I did write to elementary uh, uh, parents so that they are aware, is that it was hard in many schools to be able to have core math, writing, and uh, reading uh, instruction at the same time at every grade level. Again, because of scheduling. And so now, 
in, in every school at least three days of the week, if not more, and in many cases it is more, those subjects are taught at the same time at a grade level. And why that's important is that it gives more opportunity for uh, flexible grouping, for push-in with special education teachers and, uh, and other support people, coaches, and uh, you know we will we will see how that progresses through the year. We're, we're certainly monitoring um, the, the success and significance of this. The the other part of this is that it also allows um, the opportunity for team meetings at each grade level with the principal. Now we ha while we had dedicated in the past time during that Tuesday early release for t data meetings, what was happening is that while they occurred. The principal couldn't go to all of them. It might be, you know, six weeks before they could rotate into working with um, a given grade level. So um, we are beginning that process, and in, one, in the professional development report, uh, you'll you'll hear a little bit more about what administrators have been doing over the last year, and which is, you know, taking a course together in uh, data-wise improvement cycles. So. Um, in many schools, it also meant that we could have more common planning time at grade levels. So all in all, this has had been a significant change that we're able to see at the elementary schools. Um, so I'm going to actually ask Dr. McNeil if he talk a little bit about what the big uh, curriculum initiatives are this year. I want to preface by saying that um, these curriculum changes are also representative in our district goals, so they've been highlighted there. And much of the summer work that has taken place this past summer has been focused on making sure that these curriculum changes are rolled out uh, for the year. Uh, so just looking at, um, starting at the elementary level, we're looking at grades three and five where we have, uh, we're still implementing, we started last year of implementing new Lucy Calkins units of study for reading. And uh, we have a couple of units in in each one of those grade levels three and five that we're still that we've rolled out for this year um, and I do want to also say that over the past years we've also uh, implemented the Turk math resource investigations and so that was completed last year so I just want to know, let everyone know that that is now complete uh, but they're still working on uh, uh, you know, looking at some of the units that they're teaching and some of the some of the professional development it has still been uh, focused on that this past summer. Uh, for at the social studies, as you know, uh, we have had some major changes to the standards that were finalized last year. So at the um, at the eighth grade level, um, we have uh, a brand new resource that we're using, uh, and it's uh, geared towards civics. Um, and then also at the middle school, we've been working on uh, delineating our computer science curriculum. So we have a, a, a curriculum for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Um, those are some of the, the highlights of the major uh, curriculum changes. Also at the elementary level for kindergarten, we have introduced lessons uh, for science and social studies that are aligned with the tools of the mind curriculum. And then at the high school, we are continue to add various electives to the uh, options that students can select. So those are just an overview of some of the major uh, curriculum in initiatives that have happened. We've had other things happen as well, but those are some of the ones I would like to highlight. And curriculum leaders are going to be um, coming in over the course of the year to talk yes. about Yes. So we have uh, put out a schedule for the curriculum leaders to come in. Uh, throughout the year to give reports on how they're progressing with those major initiatives and some of the other things that they're working on in their content area and that will happen throughout the year. Our, um, and I have already scheduled Sam Hoyo and our new science coach, Sam, uh, Sarah Huber, to come in on October 10th and uh, they can introduce themselves to the community and um, you can ask them questions. Yes. Mr. Um, Lucy Calkins has been around for quite a while. We've had it in the system for quite a while. It's more than just a philosophy, am I correct? Well, yes. Well, I mean, and, and it's an approach to, to reading. It's the, I accept the fact that there are new things coming on and on. Is it a matter of uh, just training teachers, or is it uh, 
new things going on all the time well, in that area. A, well, as you introduce the new units of study, you have like new content. So you have lessons that are geared towards a particular so, genre and then okay. so. Just from my understanding, and it's a matter of adapting the new curriculum to this philosophy and developing lessons around it. Is that a well, fair well, Lucy Calkins has, has devised uh, units of study and, and in, in order to align our instruction with those units of study, we have created lessons to go along with those units of study. So are we, are we paying Lu Lucy Calkins, the company and stuff for this material? No, we send our coaches uh, to uh, the various uh, professional development opportunities and they also have like, a, what do you call it, a, 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 a resources for us to utilize in order to write those lessons. So they're, they're things that we read. I'm, I'm old school that we, mm -hmm. be, once we got the philosophy, we were to be adapting uh, the, the curriculum and stuff like that. It, I'm, I'm just, I have faith in our, our teachers and stuff. If, they, if there's a benefit, cost benefit, by sending these people out and doing it, that's great. But I, I think we have uh, wonderful resources here in the community and stuff that you're the best judge of this, and, and I trust that. It, it's just I'm going back 30, 40 years ago that once we got Lucy Calkins and stuff, and they, it wasn't the big company that it is now. I realize that now. And curriculum has changed dramatically. But uh, I just a thought to take advantage of the people that we have here. So thank you. They wanted to say something, but I'll say a follow-up after okay. that. I was, just trying, I was just trying to clarify. I think when you say we've been doing Lucy Calkins for a long time, we were doing the writing portion, right? We rolled that out for a long time, and then we started the reading portion years later. Yeah. Correct. So, but yeah, it's not the same thing. It's, yeah. I understand. Fine. Yeah, there, there are Lucy Calkins students to study for reading and writing. Mm -hmm. They are distinct. And one of the things that we've tried to do is be very conscious of implementation schedules. If we're going to do a science implementation in a fourth grade or, or, or a math fifth grade, we're not going to do all of those at the same time. So there has been a very strategic rollout of these curriculums. We're now fully, we don't fully FOSS, uh, all of our teachers have been trained in the FOSS science curriculum, complete um, training and implementation of the new for the newest version of Turk investigations. And so it, it's just, a, it's, a, it's a very phased rollout that we've been doing. Thank you. Just a I just want to say that in terms of whether or not we have a lot of capacity in the district to do anything, which we clearly do, it's always a good idea to do some cross-pollinization and get your folks to meet with others who are doing this in mm -hmm. other districts and, and, and experience some of the higher level training that will just help bring things up to, to a higher level. Also, there's a, a lot of discussion that goes along with the teachers and, and there's research that's done in order to identify the best resource to use for instruction. And so Lucy Calkins has been selected, those units of study, and they match the Reader's Workshop format. So as it's a perfect immersion and, and we like the, the, the way that emphasize independent reading in, in, a, in a way that we can provide individual and group, small group instruction as well within the, within the we just workshop format. So the Lucy Calkins units, you know, help us, you know, and as we focus on the various genres of reading, uh, you know, they've been selected because we feel like they're the best. I, I was meeting this morning with someone from ACMI and um, she was talking about her her own child's experience and was surprised that in second grade they were already learning things like the, the five W's, who, what, where, when. It is part of a journalistic approach to writing because that's the type of thing that you might even see much, much later or used to see much, much later in instruction. But I think that this year we'll have an opportunity at, at different meetings to have a, a little bit more deeper dive into a lot of this. Um, I want to come back, and, and then I'll, we can move on, but I want to come back to um, the OMS dismissal um, this last week from two vantage points. One is that you know, I've heard from people that they were contacted in so many different modalities. The reason that happened is that what we knew is that the 
people have not gone in and updated their their port their information in the parent portal. There's a there was link um, and letters sent out about the returning student, and so I, I'm using this opportunity to encourage people to do that because if your phone is wrong, then we have to count on your email. So I had to send out the the message in different forms, which meant that you got emails, texts, phone messages, um, just to make sure that you got the message. So um, it's, it's not an insignificant number of people who have not done the update. So I would encourage people to do that because I, it's hard to know what other kind of uh, unexpected event like this would, would occur that we would need to be able to contact people. And the second thing that came up is people, a couple people wondered about, you know, what you do in crises. And I do want people to understand that we do have crises teams in each school. We have crisis plans. We have evacuation sites. Um, we just decided, even though we could have brought all 900 students to the high school, they were willing to have this happen, it made much more sense to dismiss. And we have found that the efficient way to do it is really to do it through um, telephones. So even if students don't have a telephone, they borrow their phone. What was remarkable, and I, I give a lot of kudos to the teachers at Audison because in 45 minutes from the time the decision was made, there was only 15 students who had not had their permissions recorded by a teacher. And in, in that 45 minutes, they're already going back in the school to get their thing. So it was a stellar performance, which I, I, I told them all what a great job they did. It was, um, it was really, really great. So um, the last thing I would like to, to just say, end this part of the, uh, I'll come back to some other things in my report. One of the the cutest things that I heard a, a principal report about opening day was at the Gibbs. And uh, uh, Mr. Francisco said one of the students when um, he was leaving said, Mrs. DeFrancisco, this was a great adventure and I'm gonna come back tomorrow. <laughs> 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 That's great. So, we'll move on. <laughs> um, did we ask how many questions or? <clears throat> Uh, I did have one question about the, the dismissal. The yep. One concern was you know, whether our phone and, and safety systems, the alarm that went off, have battery backups because the phones weren't working and the alarm that's seemed a, not to work. That's a great question. Well, it, it tripped it, it and, and so we have to look into that too. And the other thing, um, it was, yeah, I, don't, I can't answer that question. We're going to look into why, okay. it, why it tripped having the battery the, bat the electricity go off because the battery should have been the a backup. And in fact, interestingly, um, Mr. Good, our chief of technology for schools and towns, he knew that Audison had gone off because he gets pinged uh, when any of the systems go down and he can tell whether it's down or it's, it's been backed up with a battery and actually how much battery is left. So we, we have something in place, but I don't, I can't answer that question, but I think it's a great question we need to find because, you know, um, they would have stayed in their classrooms had that not, that sensor had gone off. Ms. Morgan? Um, just one more thing about that. I think what would be helpful is if, so, because what happened was, like, as a parent, I got an email from you that explained to me everything that was happening. I got a second, I believe, like, like I totally understood what was going on. And then I got the like very cryptic mm -hmm. phone call, also via email. But what happened is somehow in this system, it called all of the kids' emergency numbers. So like my 76-year-old dad got a phone <laughs> call that said, OMS, whatever it was, the like, and I understand that we have character limitations, but that was really scary for him because he was like, her school's being evacuated, I'm the emergency contact, am I supposed to go? And I'll tell you, I love my dad, but the last thing that we needed in this situation was him driving up to the Audison to try and connect with my daughter. Thank, so thank I think that piece, like if, if I understood when those emergency contacts were gonna be triggered, I might pick different ones. So if people understand, that might be helpful. That's, I'm glad you told me that. I have not heard that yet. Um, I do know that parents that had younger children, you know, they didn't read the message clearly and they thought my kindergartner is going to be dismissed. 
So I mean, there was some of that, but I didn't know that, so I will look into why it went beyond the, the contact. So maybe you could go into the portal and just make sure that they're not in the wrong, con the wrong line. I'll try. I will tell you it took me um, two hours and 45 minutes to update the portal information for my four children. So, but I would be happy to go back and try that again. <laughs> You're supposed to be able to copy and pay. Mm -hmm. There right, was well, a lot, there was a very interesting glitch this year whereby it defaulted to all people being non-custodial parents and non like living with their child parents and nobody having pick up. So anyway, if you have well, a first grader, that's a big deal. I, so. I, could, I won't go into it a lot. In fact, David Good is going to come and talk at some point about technology. And I think it's to be um, a good time to ask him. But I do know that one of the things they were doing this summer, because we have different, we have different family arrangements that trying to change the name from like mother, father to parent one, parent two, and you would think that would be an easy thing to accomplish. It is not. So um, why, I couldn't tell you. But it would be, uh, that's one of the things. They were trying to really update the system and, and the, how things were entered. So, 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 but thank you for letting me know that. I will, I will, pa I will pass that on. Okay. Um, just also, I didn't get these messages, so I don't know. But if we're sending out multiple messages for the reasons that you're saying, it, it makes sense, but it would probably also make sense to have in the message, you know, we're going to be contacting people through multiple ways because it's early in the year and we are aware that a number of people have not yet updated their information. We're trying to make sure um, we get everyone. Yes, um, in, in hindsight, so. I don't disagree. Uh, on the other hand, I'm sitting there with one of our network managers writing this long message out and said, you only have 140 characters, go back. <laughs> Go edit, edit it all yeah. on the dime. So, but I think that's a good suggestion. And I'll, um, so you, we, we've learned from this, and there's a lot of lessons that, that showed some of the, the, the problems with our system, and we have to make sure that we update, make sure that that's all updated before something else happens, and knock on wood, hopefully not. Great, thanks. So now we are on to the enrollment update. All right, that's all for me. Well, we are approximately 140 students more in our school buildings than we had last year. This number is not a firm number yet, and it will fluctuate as we, um, over the next couple of weeks. But the thing, I, there are a lot of notable things in this, which um, you know, obviously just stand out in terms of where we are in the district. All of the classes in the high school are under 400. Um, and some of them are even under 350. You get to the middle school, and they're all over the, the high 400s. And then when you get to the elementary, all but one class is 500, over 500, with the first grade being close to 600. Goes up above and below 600 over, over each week. So um, we are, in our schools, we have uh, virtually 6,000 students and, and making our total enrollment in the, in the Allen Public Schools um, over 600, over 6,000. So that's, those are big changes and, you know, we have felt that this summer as we've tried to uh, manage classrooms. I, I think that this, this year we were not as successful um, looking at being able to balance them more evenly. <coughs> There's some years that have been better than others. This one is a little bit more off, um, but it's not for lack of uh, for trying to do that for sure. So it's one of the things that you know we are looking at again this year is maybe take as the buffer zones, and we can talk about that in another at another meeting. But um, the the good news is that I've talked to a lot of the teachers, and they're all very uh, positive about um, their classes and very excited about having them. We have had to add a couple of large class TAs in various places. And I think the one thing that I will say so people know this is that when both Dr. McNeil and I were around at all the schools looking at classes, the thing that struck me, one of the things when I was in elementary classrooms, 
that was the minority of classrooms that did not have more than one adult in the room. Just the way, you know, special education teachers were there or a, a special education TA or a large class TA or a building. There was, there were um, a lot of adults around supporting students. So um, we continue to grow and we welcome all of our new students. We will not have, as you know, um, the, the official date is October 1, but even when we have that snapshot October 1, uh, we will not have verified numbers until later in November. Questions? Um, so, uh, so just to assuage parents who are worried about the high school, I, I know there could potentially be years where the new high school feels crowded, but in general, I went back and did an analysis, um, the difference between the kindergarten number and then the ninth and 10th grade numbers, we retain about 82% on average. Mm -hmm. so, so we won't necessarily have high school classes of 600, you know, if historical averages are Right, if it's new, which they may or may not. Right, and with the new high school, they might. We'll see. But we'll see. It'll be new high school. Maybe they'll. Maybe well, they will be higher. But mm -hmm. but it's just that 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 we do lose some kids along the way to, you know, other towns, private schools, etc. Yeah, Minuteman and increasing. Minuteman, Minuteman has a new school. We may lose more. I don't call it losing students. Not losing it's just, students. It's, but I mean, but just that it, it won't be quite as overcrowded as people are worried about. Yeah even if it might feel credited. In fact, we had a meeting today um, for transi beginning transitions. There's a lot of meetings going on, which I'll talk about later for the high school, but um, we're looking at making sure in, in these all these different phases that we are gonna have, we are identifying additional classrooms in the high school through the phasing process to deal with the increasing enrollment because we, are, we, we see this as we go through this process. We're gonna have, um, you know, 50, 60 more next year, and then mm -hmm. each year, in fact, we'll probably be, before we're even finished with phasing, <coughs> close to, you know, close to 1,600 in the school. And I think that that's one of the tasks, big tasks, that Dr. Janger and Mr. McCarthy, and, and I to some extent as well, have as a task over the next month or so to identify all of these rooms in the phasing that we go through. So. We are very conscious of that, and uh, I'm, I'm confident that we're going to be able to accommodate all these students as they come forward. Mr. Hainer? My <clears throat> looking at the Hardy fourth grade, that, that it's a very crowded class. There's three of them there, 24, 25, 25. Mm -hmm. The third grade coming up, a couple, there's only four more students, and it's four classes. And I realize space is premium everywhere. But that class has, has had a lot. And if we just assume that all, all 74 of those students fall within the easy realm of a classroom, that's one thing. It, this is still very large. I'm concerned about that. I don't know the solution. I don't know if there's, a, there's space there. Uh, we just added six classrooms there. But it's, it's tough. And it, that group has been big all along. And they, they've borne the burden of that. I don't know if there's any relief. I don't know what can be done. Morgan? Um, so I just wanted to restate, like I do every year, that I find that this report is really hard to read because it doesn't include our students who are in the SLC. We have more than 30 kids at Stratton who aren't distributed to classrooms. The idea is that they are spending at least part of the day in that general education classroom. I understand that Desi has them with a different teacher of record. This isn't Desi, this is, you know, the, this report alludes to a level of accuracy that isn't really there, especially, well, for, for Brackett, Dallin, and Stratton, it, it doesn't because there are lots of kids that aren't represented on this chart. We put our Metco kids into their classrooms and into their cohorts. Um, but we don't do it with our SLC students. I think it's fine to count them out like we do with Metco, I guess, um, and know how many we have, but um, the fact that we can't seem to get them into these classes is well, continues to be frustrating to me. We have actually a new chart, and I don't know if it got delivered, uh, where we're actually do breaking it out so you can see. So we'll send it along to you. Great. Um, it's an issue of, um, of who's the teacher of record the teacher of record is not the classroom, the, the fourth grade class at 
Understood. Good. So, but yes, you are going to get that report. Um, we've had um, our uh, special education coordinators um, break that out for us, and um, that will be coming perhaps even tomorrow. Great. So you can see it. As a school committee member, this chart, the way that it is for Bracket, Dallin, and Stratton is not useful to me. Stranger? Did you just say that the classroom teacher is not the teacher of record for, for attendance and purposes? No, no, what I'm talking about is for students that uh, are in SLC, their classroom teacher there is the teacher of record. For the purpose of attendance with DESI? For the purpose of attendance and grades with DESI, yes. Mm -hmm. That's changed since I was a teacher. A lot of change since I was a teacher, but we, wh whether we had them for five minutes, a classroom teacher was was the person for record for for the purposes of attendance, chapter seventy and everything else going on because it, it was based like that. Thank you. Okay. Um, oh. Yes, Dr. Alice Nancy. Um, first, I appreciate what Ms. Morgan said about um, not including that it would be good to have something that includes the SLC students because this is a persistent problem mm -hmm. and confusing. And it's confusing to parents too because they look at it and go, well, my kid has 30 or you know what, whatever the number is in their classroom. I know that because you know, I've talked to everyone and yet this number says, so you, you know, your data is wrong. Um, so it doesn't help instill confidence in parents when they read this and see the difference. Yeah. Um, you, you will get the updated. Yeah. The thing that you won't be able to know is what the level of inclusion is, that's right. which varies. I'm not yeah, <coughs> that's fine. Okay. To do that, just mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, then my second point is, I I agree that it's unfortunate that fourth grade at Hardee's is larger, but I'm actually more concerned about Bishop first and second grades um, with 24 students, um, and then uh, Dallin second. Or I'm sorry. Bishop kindergarten yeah, and first grades, and Dallin first grade. Um, and I'm wondering, I know the kindergartens will have aids. Um, I'm wondering if we've been able to do something to help out the first grader, first grade classrooms in those two schools. Um, yes. Okay. But I will also say that we have, and we'll talk about this with the budget, we have still a lot of vacant positions, but not the two that you just described. Um, in this economy where um, there's, you know, 3.4 or 5, I don't know, percent unemployment, unemployment um, we're finding it very difficult, just like to find uh, teaching assistance. And I will say that the teaching assistants we have, we feel very grateful for. They, they frequently are teachers who are, or, or, uh, people who are going back to get their certification. Many have master's degrees, um, and this is an opportunity for them to get classroom experience. Um, but we still have some positions that are vacant, but the first grade there in the two schools do, do have extra support. Good, thank you. Steele, you're up with the hiring report. Thank you. So um, just going to go through a brief uh, overview of our new staffing for this year. So we have a few new administrators. We have a new director of science who will, like you heard, be coming in, uh, in October to present, a new assistant principal at Bishop, and a new athletic director. We are still looking for um, assistant principal um, for Stratton, working on that. New teachers, we have a lot of new teachers. Anyone in the AEA Unit A, bargaining unit includes teachers and specialists. <coughs> 71 new hires as of today. Um, most of them, the large majority, replaced teachers who either retired, resigned, or changed positions within the district. 
or on a, a full year leave of absence. Um, and then we have about 20 new positions, um, and some of those are partial FTEs, um, it, with, which includes some of the uh, new specialists that we, art, music, phys ed specialists, so some of them are part-time. Um, and again, as we, I say every year, we tend to hire a lot of people from within, a lot of teaching assistants um, who are in graduate programs who become licensed educators. We've hired 10 of them. Um, if they've been teaching assistants, building subs in, in Arlington. Um, and we have others who have done student teaching here who have been hired as teachers. Um, I just want to, uh, resignations come up. I, I, there's, I can get more data on this if you like, but I, just an overview of the, the reasons people do leave Arlington if they're resigning and going away. A large number are moving away from the area. We had several teachers who resigned because they moved out of state, either with a, a spouse or a partner, um, who had job opportunities that came up, and, um, or for family reasons to move closer to family. So a, lot, a large number moved away from the area. Another group decided to try to find a job closer to where they live so they could cut down on their commute. The commuting time is an issue in Arlington, um, as it is hard for a lot of people to live um, in this area, especially once they have families um, and want to have um, a house and some space. Um, I'm not sure if that will even, if we'll see more effects of this next year when the middle school and high school schedules change, but we're going to be on the lookout for that if, um, if the commuting time makes that more challenging with, the, with those schedules. Um, some people have career moves within education. Sometimes they, it's a combination of a career move and a shorter commute. Um, and and it, sometimes it may increase, it may be increased comp compensation. We've done a lot of studying of our salaries and we've done some work over the last couple contracts to increase them, but we're still behind a lot of, a lot of districts. And not even just our 10 manager 12 comparisons, but other districts that aren't in that group who are, you know, they're competitors in the region. Um, and then there's a couple people who've decided to move out of education, um, just uh, decide they don't want to be a teacher right now. Maybe they'll come back to teaching at some point, but they've left education. So people leave for a variety of reasons. We have a highly mobile um, workforce, especially the younger workforce can go different places and aren't necessarily tied to working in one place for many years. That being said, we do have a lot of veteran teachers here who have been here a long time. Um, so uh, some of the highlights of the new teachers we have. So we have a new, <coughs> with part of the new budget, we have a new elementary library specialist and a new elementary instructional technology specialist. So um, we decided um, when we have some challenges finding people who had uh, um, both elementary library, the, the library specialist and the technology specialist combination to really focus on the, the library specialist we have does have a very strong technology um, background, but then we decided to, for the second position, to go for the really focus on instructional technology to make that, to increase that capacity at the elementary level. Um, we have a new elementary <coughs> science coach and a new elementary social studies coach. The elementary social studies coach was um, a grade three teacher at Pierce who has moved into that um, position now. Um, we have, as I said, new additional art, music, phys ed, uh, FTEs as part of the elementary schedule, and we've hired um, to add to, to, we filled out that half cluster at Audison. Those are just some highlights that we have. Um, so it's two additional staff because of that additional half cluster. Um, breakdown by, the, by school. Arlington High School has quite a few new hires um, based on um, both increase in the increases the budget and some uh, resignations and retirements. Um, and then you can see down the list of where there's a new hires in most of the schools in the, in the, in among the teachers. I think only um, the preschool didn't add a new teacher um, this year. And then we have uh, quite a few people who are split between schools, some of the specialists um, and uh, related, special ed related service people and team chairs. We've hired, so now this slide, which I prepared a couple days ago, is now even outdated. We have probably 45 uh, new teaching assistants, BSPs, tutors. Um, 
we do have some vacancies still in that. These, again, are hard positions to fill at this time. I think the contract is helping a little bit, but you know we obviously couldn't make as great a salary increase um, the first year as 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 would be necessary to really to attract um, the wide variety of candidates that we can. We have gotten some great candidates. A lot have master's degrees. Um, others are in master's programs, um, and I think the new contract is helping that we you know people can see there is a progression now where they can move up uh, as they stay here. Um, and I think it also helps that you know, we have hired other teaching assistants to become teachers and people who get into that know that it's a stepping stone. Other new employees that we've hired in the district, we have new IT and desktop support people in our technology department, um, cafeteria and recess monitors, substitute teachers, after school program. The after school program has expanded a lot. Um, we, you know, we now have Pierce as part of the Arlington after school program. Um, and I think we have at least 65 staff in all in Hardy, uh, Thompson, Pierce, uh, and Brackett and Gibbs. And it's just, um, it's a growing program. It's, uh, it's almost its own getting all of these new hires in because a lot of them, <coughs> The process is interesting with the teachers. I probably started meeting with, you know, of the of all the new teachers, I met with the first new teacher hire for this school year in April. So we had hired someone, you know, people in April, May, June, like all summer. So it was spread out. The after school hires kind of come all at the end of August, beginning of September. So they're kind of, we have to get them all into payroll and everything. Um, so it's a little more, uh, more condensed. Again, the process, they, uh, everybody, you know, the, the schools hire, do the hiring, they do the recruiting and, and interview process, so it's a busy time for everybody, all the administrators, a lot of teachers sit on these interview committees and, in, um, and spend a lot of their own time to, to come in and, and uh, interview um, their future colleagues. Um, and then they come in and meet with me, we go over all the paperwork, um, they do their benefits, in, they get their benefits information, um, and it, we get into payroll, so it's a lot of work for everyone up here in payroll and, and our administration and um, secretaries who are typing letters all summer. Um, so we are, uh, and then the IT department has done a lot of work to get devices into the hands of all the new employees, especially the new teachers who really need um, devices to be able to, to do their jobs. So um, the IT department's worked a lot to make sure that that's happened um, as quickly as, as they can. Um, we have start the mentor and induction process over the summer with the new teacher training and orientation. Marie Janiak um, is still leading that and does a great job making sure that we have mentors for all the new teachers. Um, and that program is an excellent program, as you know, in Arlington and will continue all year. And some teachers have a second year um, mentoring if they, if, it's, if they need to. And so um, that's something that will is a top-notch program and the principals all meet with their new teachers in their schools as well. So that will continue and does anyone have any questions? Mr. Hanner? At the initial part where you said there were 72 uh, people that have left, did we, uh, I don't know how to say it politely, evaluate people out? People did we ask not to come back? I, I don't know that I can um, speak to that. I think that would be... Um, you can give us a number. You don't have to... I'm not looking for specifics and the, the reasons why. Um, there were some. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Going to the... Uh, well, I mean, you can give a report how many are voluntary, how many are involuntary, right? You can... um, I don't know. Um, I would ask you, that, I would ask you to ask council if you do need have, to... I, I will say this. We do have a, an evaluation um, procedure that every school district has that's part of the that's required by the Department of Education. We work collaborative, collaboratively with the union to create and maintain that program uh, and our evaluation system and our principals, um, you know, the purpose is to develop educators and to, for um, improvement continually. And then, you know, there might be a few who choose you know, not to avail themselves of the Well, uh, for whatever reason, and I'm not gonna, uh, there's a lot of factors involved. I'm just saying, that the 71 that you gave us, does that reflect? Well, that was 71 new hires. Those are all seven. Well, some were retirements. Of the, I, I have to give you the, I don't have the number in front of me of all the, the resignations okay. per se, but um, 
of the res it's a smaller number than that of resignations. On the, on the chart that you did for us, new teacher hires by school, could you break that down into columns in the future of uh, retirees and uh, the numbers? That first sheet oh, that you see. gave us. Oh, how many people retired? Right. Okay. Showing the retirees and those that decide to move for whatever reason. That can be a total number. Okay. That's all. Yeah, I can do that. Thank you. Ms. Seuss? Uh, so, well, I want to thank you and your team for what sounds like a very involved and in work, and, and sounds like you guys are doing a good job. So, I just want to say thank you, thank you for that. Um, I have a similar question. So, just a just a ballpark idea of the 51 teachers who left. What percentage um, were lose, leaving for professional career move slash money issues? So, is it? 10%, 25, that kind of thing. Um, maybe 20 to 25. I think, okay. and some, some, so when you look at that, that list also includes people who change positions. So this is, this is where it gets complicated here because we have um, some teachers who move from one position to another in the district. They didn't leave the district. They just moved into a different position. Okay, and so, so that's we've include, backfilled okay. their position. So that include that number includes that, those people. Got it, okay. Um, I, yeah. I, okay, so they're not necessary. So that twenty-five percent isn't necessarily all leaving the district. No, no. Okay. And I think um, I think we had like eight eight retirements from Unit A, eight or nine uh, this past year, and uh, and then quite a few. I think the majority were not professional moves within education. For more money or to, okay, to get that, out of here. That's the question. It's just I think the majority yeah. were. If you took the combination of the commute and the moving away, yeah. is probably the majority. Okay. Um, and then one more question. So, do we have assistant principals now everywhere? You didn't mention Thompson. So Thompson, Does Thompson? we have not filled the okay. assistant principal right. position. Okay. Right. Continuing to look for that. Too. Okay. So Thompson. So okay. So. So we have hired successfully at yeah. Bishop. We. We're not able at this point to hire successfully at Stratton. Um, some challenges with that hiring process. So we are back looking for someone and we're still looking for Thompson. And Thompson, okay. And okay. then obviously we still have assistant principals half time at Dallin and, and Hardy. Right. And Brackett? Brackett does not have an assistant principal. Not. We're not currently searching for one. Got it. And okay. Pierce does not. Right, yeah. right. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Mr. Steelman. Uh, so thanks for this report. My, my question, when the onboarding happens and the, uh, they go see you for uh, benefits and all that stuff, is it just you doing that or they go, they go across the street or how does that They work? don't go across the street. Okay. It's, <clears throat> I, have, I met with every new teacher in okay. the district so to go for, because I have to put them on the salary schedule. So I have to look at what their education level and experience is to determine where they should go on the salary schedule. And there's some, sometimes it's a little bit of a negotiation, but um, you know, it's ba basically based on mm -hmm. years of experience and, so and education level. And then, you know, I present the benefits, but Kelly Piggott, who's our benefits coordinator, yeah. can also, also meets with a lot of new staff on benefits, and she meets with a lot of the new teaching assistants on, um, on benefits. We do still have one of the uh, vacant positions that we, is in the budget that we haven't hired yet, is the half-time HR assistant. We just had, there were other priorities to to fill over the summer, including uh, the administrative assistant for, for Rod um, needed to be filled, which we did successfully. And um, So you didn't hire your own assistant, you just hired someone else? As well, th that was a vacancy <laughs> that needed to be uh, okay. replaced. That was, that, that was an, a current position that uh, was a retirement that we needed to replace. Uh, and then we're, we've been searching for a, a new school accountant. So there's been other uh, positions that we've been, but we will get to it uh, soon. Um, so we do need some more help, but, um, mm -hmm. but it, is, it is a busy. Yeah, it's a lot of volume for yeah. one, one, two people to share. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Ms. Morgan? Um, the other thing that I think as we look into next year that would I would just be interested in your sense mm -hmm. anecdotally is that when I look at elementary class size it classes um, where the cohorts kind of go up and down right where we have like where we go from three to four to three like where we're jumping around a little bit right like right now the only place that's like really stable at four across is Thompson right mm -hmm. so what I'm curious about is when we have when we like for example we had three kinder we had four 
four kindergartens at Hardy last year, and we have three kindergartens at Hardy this year. So that, to me, in my head, without getting into specifics, obviously breeds instability, right? That we so once we once we go up, and then maybe at some point in the future we're going to go down, maybe, right? Like there's going to be a tail off, and so I'm curious, just you know, sort of. Um, uh, I'm curious about your sense, not tonight, but just as we go into next year, if, if, you know, how that instability is impacting our hiring and if people are being moved around or if they're saying, oh, I really don't want to go and teach second grade if I can't teach this. So it's, it's a concern of mine when I see these cohorts. Yeah, no, I, I get that. I mean, that's, there were a couple changes this year that, um, where people were moved and we thought, it was okay, but then people actually ended up leaving the the district for other reasons. I mean, for different reasons um, that may have been partially related to that, but uh, may also have been related to other reasons. So um, it is concerning. It is interesting that Thompson, as you mentioned, is four, and the old, there's only one new teacher at Thompson this year, and that's um, that's uh, in kindergarten for a teacher who's on a year leave of absence. So. Um, I don't. That, that just might be coincidental. I don't know if that's uh, the reason, but um, it's uh, yeah. It's uh, one, one new classroom teacher at Thompson. There's other new. There's new PE and other other uh, staff, but um, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, yeah. I, I don't know if that might. It, it, it's hard to be as as we grow. I mean, I, I do tell new teachers that we are grow. We're a growing district, and so especially middle and high school teachers have sort of that cohort to, even though we might lose some of them along the way, but it's still gonna be growing and um, we'll need those teachers, at least those positions. All right, um, so uh, my uh, request is actually to, to, act, to, to try to get more data on the, the reasons, on the mm -hmm. breakdowns for reading, for leaving, uh, if you have it for prior years also. Um, and also, sort of, we, always, we get a list, we don't always get it from you, it's always, it used to be in the newspaper, but we get a list of all the new hires, right, the 71 new hires. Oh, okay. Um, uh, it would be interesting to also see the list of who left, right? Okay. So I know that, you know, two of the SLC teachers at Stratton left, one of the spe learning specialists at Dallin left. It seems like there's a lot of people in special education that left. That, Maybe that's, that's just anecdotally, I don't know, but that would be interesting to see. And then, you can't give us the reasons by position, but get a sense of is turnover higher in special education, which is sort of anecdotally what people think, is that factually correct? And if so, is there anything we can do to help that? Is it people just burning out because it's special education or is it, are people going to higher paying districts? Um, because that does seem to be the area where our turnover is hurting us as a district. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, uh, yeah, I, that's, anecdotally that's probably, you know, there's some truth to that, that there's, especially so, this year, there was a little more turnover. Yeah, so if we could get some more data, you know, before we go into the budget process, then we can see if there's, you know, we do have more resources. Is there something that we should be doing with supporting teachers better or, you know, giving them more professional development, getting higher salaries just for special education? I don't know. Is, is there something that we can do financially if it, if it is a problem? So, thanks. All right. Now, professional development report. Dr. McNeil. Yes, yeah, so I'm not gonna go over each uh, session that occurred over the summer or we would be here until tomorrow because we had a lot of things happen this summer. Uh, the summertime is the best time for teachers to get together with coaches and uh, curriculum leaders and directors and work on curriculum and go to PD and refine their practice. And so I just wanna highlight uh, some of the things that um, I think really uh, align with our district goals. Um, the first thing I wanna uh, focus on is the work that we did around SEL. Uh, we had two elementary um, professional development sessions uh, with responsive classroom. One of the classes that was offered, or courses that was offered, was the basic course. And we had quite a few elementary teachers attend that, as well as TAs and uh, other support staff. And we even had um, some district administrators, such as Margaret Thomas, our MECO director, 
uh, go to that particular course. And then we had the second course was an advanced responsive classroom training for teachers who have, and elementary staff who have had the basic course in the past. So I, you know, stopped by those sessions, they're you know, very <coughs> successful, and uh, the teachers and the staff that were attending it um, gave a lot of positive feedback about the presenter and the things that they were learning. Um, moving on, I would like to focus on um, the work that we did at the elementary level, uh, as, relate, as I mentioned before, we are uh, unveiling new units of study for Lucy Calkins, the, the U Lucy Calkins units of study for reading at the third and fifth grade. So uh, teachers in third grade and fifth grade got together in order to learn about the new units. And I, and I will say that the Lucy Calkins is a pioneer with the introducing the workshop model for instruction. And she's created, you know, lessons to go along with that. And, uh, and there's a, a lot of different reasons why many districts have adopted the workshop model and the Lucy Calkins units of study. And just a couple of, or like I mentioned before, it gives the teacher an opportunity to have small group instruction and one-on-one -on -one instruction. It emphasizes independent reading. And it gives the, t uh, the students choice to have rich, uh, interesting text that they can choose from because we're getting away from the, um, what do you call them, the, the um, we used to have the, um, basal reader. the basal readers and the, the, the literature and the basal readers are, is not that interesting because it's focusing on, you know, you know, word choice and things of that nature. So there's many reasons that we've chosen the Lucy Calkins units of study that have uh, helped with our instruction and provides uh, the one-on-one -on -one instruction. So I think that's very important. Um, and thank you for that. I, it was so long ago that we used basal readers, I couldn't even remember. But that's, that's the instruction, you know, when I was in, in school. So that's how the reading instruction has evolved over the years and uh, in focusing on more what it's going to engage a student and, and make learning how to read enjoyable. So I just wanted to emphasize that. Um, moving on uh, to middle school. Uh, as I said before, we have a, a new civics course at the eighth grade level, and they're introduced a new uh, text, and we also have the ele electronic version of the text, uh, so students can do their reading at home without carrying the, the, the textbook home. So we know we always worried about having to, you know, carry those heavy textbooks and the book bags back and forth. So a lot of the um, resources that we're purchasing now have an electronic version, so we just buy one text set for the classroom, and so students can access the um, online version at home. Uh, also, uh, along with social studies, we've introduced new, uh, like I said, new lessons for social studies that are aligned with the tools of the mind curriculum at the kindergarten level. Uh, so, um, you know, looking at that, 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 that's another highlight that we, and then teachers came together in order to, you know, look at the tools of the mind <coughs> curriculum and identify where those lessons can be inserted in the curriculum, the social studies lessons. Um, also, we offered a uh, course on cultural competency at EDCO where we had one teacher, one social worker, and one nurse attended that, and we did finance that because that's aligned with our district goal of uh, cultural competency. Um, I want to highlight work that was done with uh, at the high school uh, this past summer where English teachers and special educators came together to examine content uh, curriculum in order to make explicit connections um, in ninth and 10th grade reading and writing and uh, investigate alternative and supplemental titles for students in those classes. So that goes along with our emphasis on we're trying to provide the, the co-teaching opportunity. So we you know, had some professional development uh, geared towards that uh, at the high school level over the summer. Um, and that, those, those are pretty much the highlights that I've starred. Um, again, the list is extensive. Um, and so as we had a very comprehensive uh, offerings over the summer for teachers and uh, our curriculum leaders and directors did a great job at um, making sure that uh, 
our teachers had the necessary professional development that they needed to as they transitioned into a new year. Any questions? Ms. Seuss? Um, how many of our elementary school teachers are now trained in responsive classroom? Or what percentage? I would, I, I would have to come back to you with that information. I, I mean, I would say over two, the majority over two, of them. The majority, yeah. probably yeah. well over 200. Yeah. But at one point it was like 60 something percent, but so that was, you know, when I asked the question at one point, so I was just curious how, what the number is now. Is it 80 percent, 90 percent? Well, we're going to continue to offer it uh, next year. Mm -hmm. And I will say uh, our entire faculty at Gibbs have been right. trained in mm -hmm. responsive classrooms. So um, we are going to also uh, think about how we're going to market this to our seventh and eighth grade teachers. And um, so. It, it, it is becoming something that we're going to, you know, invest in over the years, and we've already made a major investment into it. And so I, I think I'm, I'm excited about it because it does help with the building of classroom communities and, and with building expectations for students. I just had one point. This summer, for the very first time, we offered the advanced version, and we had immediate sign-up. So there's a, t a tremendous interest in that as well. So I think when we go forward, we'll have to discuss it this year, but we'll probably offer both mm -hmm. next year. Right, and they do cap it at 30, so you can't go belong beyond 30 uh, participants per class. It's so that, yeah. that's also challenging for us as we move forward because the, the, the courses are quite expensive. And so you can only offer so many at one time. So and, and you can't offer. I'm just curious with the you know how we're rolling it out. I know it's a it's a process, yeah. but just sort of where we're at in terms yeah. of the rollout. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. I had a question about the elementary math mm -hmm. under developing mathematical ideas. Blah blah blah. Um, at the end of the description of what happened, it says this course was chosen as the domain of geometry has consistently been an area of improvement. I just didn't understand, is it area in need of improvement or, or I, I didn't understand that sentence. Uh, I'm, you know, I would have to go back and look at the data as it relates to that, um, but so I would have to come back and be able to answer that question uh, to, in order to clarify that statement. I, I could add a little bit to it. Uh, I think we would have to look at the data. DMI is, uh, of course, been around a long time and it's, uh, it's a exceptionally good course. We have seen some weaknesses in geometry over the years, and um, that kind of data has helped spur some um, more professional development in this area, more, and certainly encouragement to take this course. But I'm not sure that we're seeing that in this year's data as much. So we can tell you more as we get in, dive deeper into the MCAS this year. I'm I'm just saying the sentence that's in here doesn't. Oh, I see. It's just more the way it describes it. Yeah. Yeah. It says it's described as this course was chosen as the domain of geometry has consistently been an area of improvement, and it, it's been can't. one of the weaker areas. In, uh, it, yeah, that's yeah. It's yeah. just missing. It's, it's a typo. Yeah. It's yeah. probably right. yeah. It's probably a typo. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, I will I clean that I up totally for you. Or I'll clarify okay. that and clean that up. That okay. statement. All right. Um, so, this summer professional development is it is it all voluntary signups? Is there ever like for the civics? Civics was being is a new curriculum. Was that mandatory for all eighth grade teachers? How does that work? No, uh, we all the offerings that we um, give over the summer for teachers is all voluntary. These are teachers that take time out of their schedule. Um, they do get paid for it. Um, for coming and we have a set stipend that they receive per the contract, but they are taking time out of their lives in order to come in for these various uh, trainings. And so I, I just want to applaud the dedication and the passion for our teachers because I, you know, it, it's not always easy in the summertime, especially when you have families to come in and be a part of this professional development. So our curriculum leaders do a good job of making sure that the things that we're working on is relative to what they're doing in the classroom and so that they're getting this and they're finding it to be valuable. 
So, um, bec- and, and I think that the, the, the comprehensive list that you see before you is a testament to that because we couldn't do this without the, the teachers and their dedication. Yes, Mr. Hainer. Are they also uh, available to get uh, professional development points towards their recertification as well for some of these? PDPs. Right, for the programs? Yes. Great. Mm-hmm. Thank you for doing this. It, it makes life, with all the complexities that these teachers have to go through, it makes it a little bit better for them. Thank, Thank you. you. You're welcome. Great. Sounds like a busy summer. Anything else? All right. Thank you very much for that and for all the hard work over the summer. All right, Mr. Mason, your Thank turn. You. Yes. Financial report. So this is this is not a financial report. Well, this is a, it's a, a, a status of the budget update, which is um, basically we're still early in the school year to give you uh, kind of any expenditures as we're just opening up. Um, but this this uh, basically report is at a fund level view. Um, and it shows a projected expenses for just salaries. So um, most of our budget is salaries. And uh, so what you won't, will see is that you won't see the non-salary expenditures included in these budget amounts. Um, so in, in this report, you'll notice that there may be a deficit on essential school health grant, which was, uh, we originally had level funded uh, all of our grants, and this is a, a grant that we uh, were not awarded this year. Um, but as a, as a team, we decided that uh, it made sense to still support uh, having the, the resource nurses uh, provide services. So that will essentially be part of uh, the town appropriation uh, part of the budget, uh, which then nets to a, a, a balance that's shown here. Uh, so what we're projecting with all salaries on the for the regular town appropriation is around seventy seven thousand but the other funds uh, all the grants they're basically in line uh, on the sped ninety four as IDEA uh, there was some savings uh, on people that got swapped out um, so there may be some recalibration on on the salaries on that on that particular um, fund. And the others where there were replacement of higher salaries, uh, we will be recalibrating to ensure that those will be balanced. Um, but in general, that, uh, you know, in the projected expenses, uh, I'm sorry that I didn't really clarify, is that it also includes the vacancies that Rob was talking about earlier. Um, and in, in the vacancies where positions that we still haven't filled, there's, there are cost savings that are prorated. Um, which drives part of our balance, which is not a, a major balance where we can decide to do something going forward. But as we are seeing a proration of these, the balances, these will show up on the monthly reports, but the district leadership team will definitely uh, make efforts to reallocate resources to provide, uh, uh, you know, we'll, we would recruit and hire where it is needed to provide uh, instructional support in the classroom. Um, And I think that's basically, that would sum up where we stand. If anybody has any questions in terms of where we stand in terms of the budget, um, in terms of the salary side, uh, I feel I can try to answer as many questions or get back to you with anything. Yes. I think Um, you said this. Ms. Seuss, go ahead. Sorry, I just might be, I'm not understanding it. So the um, projected balance savings is in many cases just the fact that there's a vacancy that we haven't filled yet. I'm sorry, repeat yourself? The the projected balance savings that we have, the extra money, is in many cases just that we haven't filled a position. Is that right? Um, Or or there's there's turnover savings as well. So there are a lot of positions where we have hired um, people, uh, the the replacements to the the prior employee that were at lower wages. But as well, there's a net to the other side. There are times where a lot of the, um, the new addition positions we've hired above what we thought was the estimated salary amount was. Sure. So they, they kind of net out. Um, but in the end, yes, the, the vacancies do provide most of the savings here. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Ms. Morgan? Can you just remind me what's under the instrumental, instrumental music fees? Is that just um, three, four, five in elementary and the private lessons after school? Or what's, what's in that 
bucket? Um, those are the private, um, the in-school private lessons. Mm -hmm. we, we fund two positions out of that. Okay. All right, um, so my question is on the essential school health grant. Correct. I, I didn't know about that grant. Okay. It's not listed in the budget. Okay. Um, so I know that wasn't you know you're doing because you inherited most of the budget before you got here, mm -hmm. um, but it would be useful to make sure that there's not other grants. I mean, if it's just you know the AEF grant or whatever, that's that's a little bit different. But um, these regular grants that are funding positions that we may have to fund ourselves if they go away it would be good to include them okay. um, on the list uh, of grants in the budget. Noted. I, I'll just add a. Normally, if, if, a, if a position is funded in a grant, the grant goes away, the position goes away. It's happened with some of our Title I positions this, just this year even. It's just that in this particular case, um, we just decided that it has been so difficult to have the, the nursing support that we need that we needed to, to fund this. It was, it was disappointing that we didn't continue to have it, but. It, I, I'd have to go back and look in the old budget sheets whether it was in there or not. I yeah, couldn't I mean, tell you off yeah. the top of my head. I think we've been a little bit inconsistent. Like safe and supportive schools grants, sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. We're not getting one now, I don't think, right? Safe and supportive schools. No, not really. Yeah. No. Um, but yeah, so we've been a little bit inconsistent on what grants get put in. And kindergarten grant used to be put in, now that's gone, but it's still, it's still listed there as hist for historical reasons. So mm -hmm. I, I think it depends. I think the state funded grants have typically been in there. I don't know what, what funded the essential school grant, school health grant. State. Yeah, state. state. Yeah. So that, it's odd that that one wasn't in there. But. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll add all of okay. the grants that we know at the time yeah. when we're developing the budget to be, part of, to be part of the budget. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, I have other things that are on here besides just that. Um, um, so I do have the, the facilities report update, but uh, we are, we're still working on that report uh, with the transition of the new facilities director. Uh, so the next meeting we will have a, um, a, a presentation or a report to present to the school committee. Um, but he is transitioning well. And new, did they hire, they hired someone? They hired an interim at, at the current moment. Um, okay. It actually was an internal employee on the town side. Uh, Jim Feeney, yeah, he's been great. Um, but I also wanted to, you know, thank the facilities teams uh, for all the work that they did in the summer to help prepare the schools. Um, uh, it was also a great pleasure. I didn't get to work with Mark initially, but he, when he came back to help during the summer, Mark was very great, and uh, Mark Miano was very great <coughs> with helping. Uh, the successful completion of this, uh, the summer projects. Uh, as you know that we didn't have a, a facilities director. He came in, acted part-time to help consult and um, provide support to the team and mentor. Um, and, but the facilities team did do work at all buildings, uh, at all schools. The um, facilities team painted some capacity at every single building, whether it was hallways, classrooms, um, and they had the help of the student workers, which we normally provide some funding to, to, for student workers to, to help the team paint. And they actually moved at a remarkable pace this year. Uh, the custodial team was commending the, the performance of the students, so that was great. Um, besides the flipping of the classrooms and obviously the normal wax on the floors, um, uh, they installed various whiteboards and prepared converting of classrooms. They converted the daycare, uh, at, uh, a classroom at the Hardy, and as well as a science room here in the high school. And they did also complete a lot of preventative maintenance work um, and did a lot of electrical work to set up things such as uh, installing like new iPads in the media center uh, or assist with that. Um, all while the facilities department was doing their own central move in the high school um, to accommodate space for high school, some other high school space uh, for services for, for different team members. So I, once again, I want to thank the facilities team. So we'll provide a full update on facilities projects in the next meeting.
And then lastly is I just wanted to present what we submitted to uh, or requesting from the capital plan. So that did not necessarily make it into Novus, but it's the table that you see in front of you. So I will just basically explain the chart. Um, and it's, it's set, separated by the categories that the town use in the capital planning process. Uh, so these, the capital planning process, we, we, at this time of the year, at, by the end of uh, August, we're, we're submitting the requests for the, the, next, the upcoming fiscal year, as well as uh, setting up additional four years of what we are anticipating. And then it goes through a process where we meet a few times throughout the year to try to vet all of the submissions and see what Will, what will get approved or be proposed to, to bring to town, town meeting. Um, some things do not necessarily get uh, approved. Not everything on this list may, may not get approved. Um, some things get reshuffled around based on priorities uh, or based on the other emergency needs of the towns or schools. Um, and so on here, I sh I'm showing the five-year plan that I proposed. I actually, there's a 10-year plan to this. Um, with, then there's the funding sources that I added to this, this particular document to spell out this is the first year we're submitting some energy efficiency projects. Ken Pruitt uh, uh, is the, one of the, the, the coordinators on energy efficiencies in the town, and so we, we collaborated in trying to de determine how to fund projects, but at the same time get uh, he, uh, most of the project that he works on uses the Green Communities Grants. And so those are award, they've been awarded year after year to Arlington, but um, it's been stated that we may not be getting as many awards because the town has not necessarily always contributed a portion to uh, a matching part of it. So the idea is a lot of these projects are capital related, is to try to get some funds that will be supported from the town to make the payback look better so we can get more likely get awarded for some of these projects. At the same time, it will save us on the operating side. So a lot of times it will reduce utility costs, which we had a high uh, uh, year on utility costs. Also in this capital plan, we planned uh, last year, uh, we had two playground projects that were approved. They were uh, under, well, they were estimated lower, they were, the estimates were low compared to what the bids came in uh, when we actually went after the design phase and got the construction documents and put it out for bid. Uh, this year we are going to request additional funds to try to complete these projects uh, in the fiscal 21. Um, and other things are just general uh, equipment uh, like school buses, uh, changing or vehicle vehicle changes. Uh, we're, we're requesting some additional vehicles in the next few years, not additional vehicles, but replacement of vehicles in the facilities department to try to um, actually make uh, vehicles the build to, to do plowing, to bring some of more of the snow removal back in-house versus relying on an outside vendor. Um, and uh, so that's basically summing up. Oh, well, another notable is the Hardy roof. I think that some people uh, have heard that there's been problems with the Hardy. Uh, so the Hardy roof will, is out in 2024, but that's uh, due to we have to complete uh, the, the, the replacement of the, uh, the, the rooftop unit, units at the Hardy first, so before actually trying to install or fix the roof. And that's all in this plan. Any questions? Oh. I'm going to use my prerogative to, to speak first. So first, thank you for presenting this. Yes. Um, previously, we hadn't been presented with the plan at all. Um, last year, we, I think we got the plan after it had been submitted. I guess this has been submitted. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I think it, maybe it's worth reaching out to MASC, but I, I, I'm still uncomfortable with a capital request going to the Capital Planning Committee without being reviewed by us first. For example, requesting modulars at Bishop and Gibbs is a little bit uncomfortable given the, the other project we've already mm -hmm. requested. And I think that would have been a useful conversation for us to have. Mm -hmm. um, we can still have that conversation at another meeting. Um, uh, or we can send it to budget subcommittee. But I, I guess we need to think about, I know this is due in August, and so it's hard to prepare it in May or June. Um, I, I was welcome. I was, perfectly open to have a, having a summer meeting if we needed oh. to do this. Okay. Um, budget subcommittee could do it as well. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I think we need to think about as a committee is, is should we be having a, a role in this request process or is that really something that's 
that's typically delegated to administration, so I, I would like to look into that. Mm -hmm. um, I said this last year, and, and um, uh, you weren't here, mm -hmm. um, but I think both the roof replacement projects are very good projects for um, uh, um, building authority. MSBA. MSBA yeah. um, repair projects. You may, 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 may even you know, want to do one at a time or package them or whatever and pull them earlier um, to, to at least start submitting those requests. Um, so something to work with um, the new facilities director on. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Schlickman. So the uh, energy efficiency projects are all lighting upgrade? No, well, that's what we're putting under the energy efficiency projects for Ken Pruitt, which he was proposing. But there are other projects that would be related to energy efficiency, like the replacement of the boiler. Um, that's at the, um, I'm trying to remember what school location was that. Hardy. That we put that on, but it's on the, at the Hardy School. The Hardy Boiler is also in 2022, mm -hmm. um, but the, the, there is a limit on how much the town can be awarded. Mm -hmm. So we, are, we, we request a maximum of around $200,000 worth of projects from the Green Communities Grant a year, and that's between both the schools and towns. So it's, it's kind of a easy grab to do some of the LED projects that have uh, easy bang to do that and the easy implementation and install. But that does not mean that we are not going to work with Ken Pruitt mm -hmm. on, the, on the, another energy efficiency project with the Hardy Boiler, which would save the district money as well. So my question is, how long does it take to recover the cost in terms of electricity savings if we mm -hmm. go through the building and, and do that? Yep. So there's a formula that when you fill out the grant, it, mm -hmm. it calculates all that. Mm -hmm. Ken Pruitt is better to answer that question, mm -hmm. so I'll try to come back with more okay. information for you with that. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Hainer. Just for clarification, what you were asking for, the issue on modulus uh, for the bishop is, is in the upcoming uh, fiscal year 21. Uh, that would be dealing with the capital planning budget, if I'm correct, for coming up. So we should, I think we should be discussing that as soon as possible on that part. With regard to Gibbs, that's several years down the road. I'm not saying we shouldn't discuss it, but the priority should be those things that are affecting the 21 uh, capital budget and where it is and things of that nature. So I support mm -hmm. the chair in that mm -hmm. as soon as possible. Yeah. I, I, if I could say something that um, these projects are, um, well, some, most of them, like the outgoing years are placeholders, right? Um, but if we, we, we may not get approved it, we, we're still early in the game. If we need to make a change, we can still change that. I probably, we can't add anything, but if something needs to be removed off of it. So it's better to uh, kind of put a request in versus, and, and plan for it instead of being in a situation where we're backed against the wall and we, we can't, we'll be reacting. This is more of a proactive measure. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, two questions. One, I don't see uh, IT anywhere on here. On the, the capital planning process, IT is done in a separate manner, and David Good actually handles the okay. IT. So, so this is this so is. So there is something out there, but it's not on this sheet yes. because it's on a different sheet. Yes, correct. But I can get that information for you. Okay. Yeah, I think we'd like to see that too. Um, and second. I'm wondering about the water penetration at Bishop. Mm -hmm. I thought we've done that once already. We, we have done different things at Bishop already, but a, the full range of, of updates, uh, upgrades that were going to be done have not been completed. Okay. For example, the hill, as you look at on the side, that hasn't been done yet. I will say what we have done on the driveway side, the, par the parking lot side, has been very successful. We put in a submarine door there, uh, uh, truly, it's, it's designed for submarines so that water would not penetrate that area. But there's still more things that need to be updated with Bishop. Okay, so this can, isn't like the envelope. This is no. other things, right, because we did the envelope. Didn't we? We've done some things with it. Yeah. That, if I may. Yes. My, one of my concerns is Bishop is an ongoing issue. Mm -hmm. And if we had all the money in the world, we'd pick it up and move it away from where the, the puddle it's sitting in. So every spring the water comes up and it comes up. We fix a spot, it comes up somewhere else. We fix a spot, and this is another indication of where it is. So 
what we've done from what I've been told and what I've seen has been effective, but it has not solved the, the, the total problem right. over there. Okay. I, I think I was thrown because it says water penetration. We've used and, that term. And that's, we've and used that, that sounds like envelope right. to me, and I thought we've done that because I'm pretty sure we have done that. But but this is, I, I understand now what you're talking about. So it's, it's more the description isn't. Yeah, I can, I'll get clarification for you. It's okay. all. It's all been planned out. This is something that was submitted prior yeah. okay. and Great. part of the plan before I got no, here. I'm just, um, okay, those are my questions. Oh, Mr. Hillman? Um, so I want to go back to the modulars. <coughs> uh, so the, our goal is to try to get modulars at the Bishop for FY21 for the next school year. Is that? Yeah, can I speak to that yeah, one? Yeah, whoever wants to. So we have a situation where if we added one more classroom at Bishop, we would have to eliminate an art or music room. Now, that's a possibility that that could happen. And we're developing a plan for next year in case that did happen. But as we look long term, we have this bishop sit, sort of sits right in the middle of the town and is, has three buffer zones to different schools that we have to look carefully at. But this is really putting the ore in the water so the capital planning knows that this might be a possibility, as um, Mr. Mason was saying, that we have to, I think having a discussion here is really quite appropriate. Maybe the facility subcommittee on this, uh, perhaps an earlier discussion. Um, what we're going to do to alleviate some of the pressures that we're starting to see increasing there. If you look in the, the chart, they have sort of consistently mid-20s, you know, 24, 25 class size classrooms. And that they're all, they're, they would prefer a little bit fewer students, but they're fine with that. It's, it's really that you, you can't have, we don't want to go into 27, 28, so we're gonna, we'd have to have another classroom, and where are we gonna put the other classroom? Wait, so would there just be one unit, or would you purchase two? Well, that's, that's also part of it. I don't, it's possible to have one. I mean, that may be all that's necessary if we needed one more classroom. Yeah. But it may not be, when they investigate, it may not be financially prudent to do it that way either. Okay, because I, mean, I, I see we have, a, there's a meeting of the facilities subcommittee coming up, right? Uh -huh. yeah. mm -hmm. Yes. So, yeah, so who's on that? It's you, Bill? Two of us. Okay, so. Left yeah. notes. Oh, just, oh, yeah. So I, I, mean, I just feel like um, it opens up a lot of questions about space uh -huh. that's comprehensive. It's, it's sort of a, it's sort of a, district-wide, it feels like it's the beginning of a district-wide conversation. We have to mm -hmm. go back and do I'm, a I'm space not, analysis. Yeah, by the way, I'm, I'm not opposed to putting something in a plan as a placeholder to try to alert the Capital Planning Committee that mm -hmm. this is what we need and to start thinking about this. And I, I totally support the, the idea of just putting things in there and starting yeah. to put our request in so they know what's coming. Um, so that's not the question, that's not what I'm, that's not the issue I'm raising. The issue I'm raising is I think is a more comprehensive, global, strategic mm -hmm. process that we may have to consider if we're talking about <clears throat> um, a modular, modular classrooms at the Gibbs in uh, a few years and a modular classrooms at the, at the Bishop next school year. So it just feels to me like with this, with this, these two, which is, I mean, these are, you know, the whole expenditures of the capital project of the town over, you know, $600,000 over, you know, several years is not a lot of money, but <clears throat> if there's a larger issue about the, about about school enrollment at the elementary schools, which I think we all know there is, there should probably be a, a more comprehensive discussion. I that's totally my, agree. Yeah, that's my. Yep, that's what we're, we did. We need to do doing space analysis. Uh, we're looking at. I've already begun the process of, of trying to do an analysis on buffer zones, which we'll engage in more as we go on. Now, this we, when we had the last demographic um, analysis, we saw more growth on the east side of town. There's been some growth, but not at the level that we're starting to see now on the west side of town. And um, we need, for example, in the, that forecast, and even in our own forecast, um, we didn't see peers going to three classrooms as quickly as they have and, and staying there. And they get into that number where they're, you know, they have smaller classrooms as a result, but at the same time, they would be huge classrooms if we didn't do three. Um, but we need to take a look at all of that, and I think that that is something that facilities um, is a, is a, would be a good, good place to have that work done. 
just mentioned, where are we on the getting information on the demographics? Are we still uh, looking for a, a firm? Yeah. We, we're, we're looking at the references of that firm. Thank you. We don't have a big choice. <laughs> I understand, but yeah. We, yeah. We, we're also in a spot we need to have good figures to make good decisions. Well, true. I will tell you that doing some of that already internally, working with Adam Karowski, he and I have been working on it for the last month. So more to be talked about on this one. Ms. Morgan? Um, I just, I want to just reiterate, I really want to go to capital planning with as good of a plan as possible. These are, they are, they are, you know, mostly volunteers, they are plan oriented people. When they see something in a chart, they think that's what's oftentimes they're like, well, this is what's going to happen. And so I just, you know, it makes me really nervous to see, you know, modulars at Bishop. Well, is that one? Is that two? Is that buy? Is that rent? And, and, you know, is that number even a good number? Because we, we were here, you know, four years ago talking about modulars at Stratton and it was re like we couldn't even get to a number. And so it was, it was just, it was kind of um, an unfortunate, it, just, it didn't, I guess we're better than going with a bad, like I don't want to go with a bad number because we're too good for that. Yeah. So I just want to make sure that we're having the conversations, we're asking for what we want, we have good numbers mm -hmm. um, because we have good people. So I just want to make sure that they're, that's reflecting yep. who we are. So I did contact a vendor to get a rough estimate. Uh, so the cost of the modulars, this would be for two modular classrooms, um, whether we was to buy or to lease over uh, the, the period of time that we were looking for um, was going to be around two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Now, if there's any prep work or whatnot, there's some buffer in there, um, but we won't know that information without a plan in terms of looking at where the modulus would go. Mm -hmm. right. Mr. Stephen, was that modular number lower than what we were looking at a couple of years ago? Because I remember them just spiking when we were looking at what to do when uh, we ended up going to add the permanent classrooms uh, to Thompson and Hardy. It was, th that's in the ballpark. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They're expensive. I and, know they are. Yeah, they're really expensive. And so if we don't have to go with modulars, we can, we can work on our space issues a different way. Th that would be ideal. Mm -hmm. The purpose of this is to, uh, before people that we are, we have space issues, mm -hmm. continue to have space issues, and there's going to be some for perhaps um, decisions that we would have to make together mm -hmm. in terms of what we're going to do about that. And I agree, it's a good placeholder, but that number was very scary the last time I saw it. I'm wondering if I've become, become anesthetized or it's become more reasonable. That's why the, for the high school, we're very glad we're not going to have modular yeah, classrooms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, look what happened with Stratton, how expensive that was. Mm -hmm. And that's money you don't ever, you know, have any value in. Mm -hmm. Mrs.? Yeah. Um, yeah, so actually one question on modulars, but I have a couple other questions. So you said it was the same price to buy or to lease? No, it was... Um, similar prices to buy or to lease over this, the, the period of time we I would see. need the modulars. Okay, got it. Yes. Okay. So, and so obviously if we were to lease, it, it, wouldn't it, be a, to be. it wouldn't be the $300,000 request it. in that particular okay. year. Okay. Um, yeah, so just some small questions. One, um, the LED lighting upgrades, I assume that uh, Thompson, Stratton, and Gibbs have LED lights because they're new. Mm -hmm. um, so that leaves Audison and Hardy. Are they LED? at this point or so Audison on the plan has phase two of the lighting which will wrap up whatever is oh, in there okay actually mm -hmm. then the only question is that Hardy then and Hardy is, is, is being completed this year okay good. so what okay. you don't see is the project that yeah yeah I just wanted to okay okay yeah um, that's one question um, the Audison step repair which has been in the budget for years and keeps yes. getting pushed out <laughs> was all, always in at 20,000 and now now there's an extra 30,000 so what is that um, um, that was just the a recommend, stages, recommendation of Mark Miano okay. when we were talking about the plan, but they had started work this year okay. on some of the Audison step repair, and then 
some of the information that they got said you may need some additional money in the outgoing year. So I just put the placeholder in. I haven't got a place. I see. We don't know plan. exactly how much that's going to yeah. cost. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then that Hardy Playground number looks pretty specific. What is the total cost then of the Hardy Playground? Well, the, the, the bids came in, the lowest bid came in around $874,000. Okay. Yeah, so um, after the design and whatever was left in that particular capital fund, this is the additional funds needed to meet that lowest bid. But uh, we're not sure on what the, the, you know, we're still working out what methods are we going to do. Is, is it better to go out to rebid? Maybe we'll get more bidders and maybe something more competitive. Um, like a lot of money. Yes. Yeah, I mean, Magnolia what, costs like a quarter of a million, right? Yeah. The whole Magnolia playground. Yeah. So, although they didn't have a rubber surface, yeah. so I don't know if that's the issue, but. Well, that is um, probably more than half the budget on these, on a lot of these right, projects. Right, part which I know the, is not recommended. Part of the reason we people. think that the, it came in high, but I think they're going to come in higher than what was estimated, is that the qualifications they put on the bid in terms of being completed by November. Mm. And um, mm. so there were, there were different. Uh, specifications. Got it. Because that was a big yes. part of it. So that's why the question is should we rebid this? Right, right. And okay. when should we rebid it? Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Great. That complete your report? That is it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you for all those updates. You're busy too. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, I, 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 I only have two, two additional things. You've been having lots of reports tonight. I recognize that. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit more about the high school. Um, we, we, and, and again, take this opportunity again to say thank you to the town because we are, we've been moving forward quite earnestly over the summer. There's been lots of meetings, many different subgroups. And, and as you get, we're in the design development phase. And uh, we are, the reason for these meetings is a lot of details that have to be um, worked out in this design because we go to cost estimators for this stage in November. And then following that, uh, we will perhaps have to do some adjustments based on how the costs come in versus what the budget is because we have a budget for the high school. That's our budget. And so, it's not, we're, we adjust the, the, to what we need. And, and, and it's, sometimes it's not, um, just some small adjustments can make a big difference too in cost. So at any rate, we're, we're not quite there yet on the, and making decisions about value engineering, but um, that is happening. And there's going to be a community forum. It's going to be on October 30th. And this will be a chance for the community to come and uh, hear updates about the project, have a chance to ask questions, um, and uh, we'll be advertising that quite, uh, more. I, and Dr. Allison Ampey, who's on the communications subcommittee, and might want to say a little bit more about the forum. No, the forum's still under um, way, but um, much earlier than that will be at Town Day. And yes. so we're gonna have a Booth will have two members of the building committee all, at all times, plus members of the construction team and the architects and, and architects. Mm -hmm. uh, the construction, the owner's project manager. So if anyone has any questions, it's a great time. You know, come by, find us, talk to us. We'll have pictures, we'll have models, we'll have a, a couple laptops um, to show our fly through. So there'll be lots mm -hmm. to see. Mm -hmm. All that, all that. Materials are being gathered today, ready to be ready to go, and uh, it's in the same place that it was last year. So it's it's you know it's sort of halfway down toward Pleasant Street from Town Hall, and at 11 o'clock I'll put another pitch in for our music groups. The jazz bands are practicing, and we have magicals that are going to perform on the steps on the stage at 11 o'clock. So you can go to the music and then you can walk down to the booth or booth and then, then the, the music. Um, so there'll be more updates as we go along. Um, I also have one last report and this is actually uh, from Dave Good um, because you know, being ready for a smooth opening involves many, many people in many different ways and I think it'd be, it's important for you to to know the extent of the IT involvement this summer, because you asked the question about, uh, about the IT budget. Um, I don't know if we can see that too well. Do that. 
So, um, so in the current technology plan, uh, the third, fourth, and fifth grades at the Pierce, Brackett, Dallin, and Bishop receive new Chromebooks and carts for each classroom at these grades. So that involved having 1,000 Chromebooks to the above classrooms, which all had to be imaged and, and set up uh, by our IT staff. So that was an, an amazing accomplishment this summer. In addition to that, they outfitted two new high school science classrooms with laptop cart and Chromebook cart and, and, and uh, short throw projectors. Those two science, that we've had some rearranging of classrooms because our enrollment is growing. And last year we were in the situation with science that we had like 95% usage of our classrooms, which was um, almost impossible to schedule all the classes into them. But anyway, that's happened over the summer. Um, all, the high school math lab uh, was upgraded with two new Chromebook carts and new Chromebooks. And all schools, um, except for the high school, which will be a huge challenge, have been upgraded to the new VoIP, Voice Over Internet Protocol, telephone system. Uh, it's in the high school is in the process of being scheduled. It's been a little bumpy. Uh, I won't say it's, but it's definitely has been um, a huge accomplishment of the technology department in getting this getting this accomplished. Um, so we're also um, replacing aging PCs in the Audison Media Center with Chromebooks, and we've had more Chromebooks given to the ELL department. And we've added 25 new iPads and carts to the new first grade classroom at the Stratton. We've increased, uh, now this one's really important, actually. We increased the district's internet bandwidth capacity to six gigs. A couple years ago, I had gone to a conference and heard that really the, the recommended ratio was one gig for 1,000 students, and at that time, we had one gig, and in these few years, we've been working steadily to getting us up to six gigs, which we now have accomplished um, uh, because we're now 6,000 students. Mm -hmm. So th this, is, this has been a terrific um, piece of work. And so then, then, you know, there's just the upgrading and the removing of Chromebooks, and it's just a lot of devices that they keep track of in the district, both in terms of just keeping track of them, imaging them, repairing them, um, d distributing, ordering, all of that. So I want to thank the IT department. And all of this is in the IT part of the capital plan that they get money for. So uh, Dave Good, um, who is the, both the town and school director of technology, is going to, um, we're going to schedule him sometime this fall to come in and talk about a number of these initiatives and just the, the, the big picture of technology. So that completes my report. Okay. Mr. Schmidt. A um, question popped up uh, on the Arlington list over the possibility of some little critter hanging around the Gibbs. Uh, conjecture had it at uh, baby possums, but uh, I wonder if you heard about that or know anything about. Uh, I haven't heard about possums at Gibbs. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't be surprised, but I haven't heard about. It. I've heard about rats. Well, I heard about town. the rats, but then the conjecture said, "Well, they don't really look like rats. They look like baby possums." So. I don't know, but there was something over there at the start of school. Possums are good. They eat bugs. Yeah, they are good. So if we got possums, we're happy. If we got rats, mm. mm -hmm. yeah. we have more rats. The town has a major the problem. The town has a big problem. Yeah, no, there's major. a lot of rats in town. Right. Four-legged, we're talking about now. Yeah, I know. Just <laughs> want to clarify. Um, I have a quick question about the high school project. Uh, everybody keeps asking me, are we still on schedule to start July 1st? Is that still under under review or? The, the plan is still to break ground in the spring of 2020. Great. 
Uh, today I was at a meeting with all the phasing diagrams, when we're going to do what. Actually, we start doing some uh, geothermal and we do some work in the front lawn. There's just, it's definitely on track. Mm -hmm. yeah, we year for flex. We, we've been working on the timing schedule, so that's why I'm, I'm just checking. So my understanding right now is that we'll be doing what's called pre-work, um, mm -hmm. which is enabling, and that's going to start in spring 2020 mm -hmm. and go through the summer, and then construction is going to start at the end. But it's all it's on schedule. It's mm -hmm. just this is what the schedule is. But groundbreaking, so plan for a groundbreaking like a ceremony sometime in the spring. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. have, no, with the MSBA, with the MSBA, though. Yeah, I'm okay. just not sure if you're going to do groundworking for the pre-work or for the Well, it'll be a ceremony, right. Yeah. You, get your, goals a, you get your goals okay. and shovel I'm being, I'm being picky. Mm -hmm. Do I see you have a community forum scheduled for October 30th? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, then you've got a community forum scheduled for October 30th. Mark right. the calendars. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else? Go for it. All right. So the next item is uh, appointment of uh, Dr. Bodhi t as the voting member of the EDCO Collaborative Board. Um, from the Articles of Agreement, each district member executing this agreement shall annually appoint the superintendent of schools or one school committee member as a voting member of the Collaborative Board. Uh, Dr. Bodhi has traditionally served on the committee. I, I did note that there are three towns that send school committee members as their representative instead of their superintendent. So just in the future, if anybody is interested, um, that's something we could think about. Um, but uh, uh, for now, it's Dr. Bodie. So uh, can I get a motion to? So moved. Second. All right. To appoint Dr. Bodie to the vote as a voting member of the EDCO Collaborative Board. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Uh, all those opposed? Any abstentions? Uh, unanimous. Thank you. The consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted in one motion. There will be no separate discussions of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in normal sequence. Approval of warrant, warrant number 19279, dated 7-12-19, in the amount of 553-709.45. Warrant number 20020, dated 8-18-19 in the amount of 687.685.38, warrant number 2041, dated 827.19, in the amount of 446.784.40, approval of minutes from June 13th, 2019, regular meeting minutes, and there's no trip for approval. So move. Um, so. Can we pull the minutes? Sure. Um, okay. So. Which minutes? Oh, there's, there's only, only one. one. Yeah. One. So approval of the uh, other items, the warrants. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Yes. yes. Any opposed? Uh, abstentions? All right. That's unanimous. Then the uh, minutes, Dr. Okay. Alice Nampi. I'm sorry. I hadn't downloaded them. And is this where we um, – are these the minutes that, that Mr. Spiegel took? I okay. So. I didn't – he had asked me to add my – to send him my comments to add to the minutes, and I didn't. And I'm wondering if they could be approved with the understanding I'll submit my comments and they'll be added. It, it's we can what hold I hold it's, them next time. Okay. Yeah. Let's just wait. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very comprehensive. I take a lot of notes. I, I'm, I'm not the. I'm not a, They're a very different style. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Try to catch everything. It's hard sometimes. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, uh, next item is discuss vote appointments to subcommittees. Um, so that uh, uh, let me just pull up the list. So we have um, a, rep a non-voting representative on the town elec election modernization committee. Uh, and and uh, Ms. Seuss has, has generously volunteered <laughs> to serve on that. Uh, the, we had uh, discussed uh, previously that um, with the uh, announcement from Dr. Bodie that we wanted to put together a search process committee for the superintendent's position. 
Uh, just to be clear, this is not the search committee. This is a committee to help us design the process for conducting the search. So we're, we have plenty of time. Um, we uh, uh, have, have uh, fortunately, the luxury of time that we can very carefully select, typically select a consultant, um, design an, a community input process, create a position description, do all of that in this, this school year, and then hit the ground running in the following school year with, with opening the position when the consultant decides that's best. So uh, I am proposing that Mr. Schlickman be the chair, Dr. Allison Ampey and, and Ms. Seuss be the members of that search process committee. And also, the, I had left the negotiation subcommittees uh, empty because I didn't know that, didn't expect to have negotiations, but um, we do expect to have some issues to negotiate with the AEA. So uh, Mr. Schlickman and myself are proposed for that. Is there any discussion? Uh, yes, Dr. Aslanpi. We have a motion to create the search process subcommittee. First. Yes, yes, we do. Yes. Okay. Mr. Hainer. I mean, just a brief discussion on, you just mentioned the idea of having that uh, process committee put the process in place for us to start next year. I, I personally feel that we need more than a year. We should have more than a year uh, to, to do it. So I, I guess I'm suggesting a report date back from that process committee, probably uh, the end of February, the beginning of March. I'd like to suggest that as part of the motion. Sure. All right, so we do need, let's um, take each item separately. Uh, let's get a motion to appoint uh, Ms. Seuss to the elect Election Modernization Committee. So moved. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Who seconded that? Oh, sorry. I will. I can second. Oh, anyone? <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Unanimous. And now a uh, motion to create a search process committee. Uh, with the members, Paul Schlickman is chair. We, we need to say what the committee is supposed yes. to do. Mm -hmm. Yes. The per. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You want to do two, two motions? Motion. First, step, establish the committee and then. I think you can do it all members. in one motion. It doesn't really matter. Uh, uh, establish a search process committee with Mr. Schlickman as chair, Dr. Allison Ampey, and, and Ms. Seuss as members. The purpose of the search process committee is to. Uh, design the process for conducting the superintendent search with an interim or with a report back to the committee no later than uh, March 30th. Okay. Uh, early March. Let's March 15th. Thank you. <laughs> Split the difference. No later than. It can be earlier. Can March. Be early. In March. Yeah, I'd like to get going with this pretty quickly. Uh, what we really need to do is establish what sort of community process we want to do and, and then come up with a, uh, uh, an RFP that would uh, cover what that. we're envisioning. And that's, that's the uh, task in the end product that I would get deliverable, so to speak, would like to have by, the, by, by March so that we, we have that all voted on, we've got an RFP ready to go, and uh, we can then go and put out the RFP, uh, secure a consultant in the spring and be ready to go uh, uh, in, in the end of, you know, the end, at late spring, early summer, and be able to advertise the position in the beginning of September. So you made the most so moved. Mm. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Um, All right. Is this just, sorry? Just one more thing. Further discussion? Yep. Uh, just uh, um, so I've been collecting some documents. Uh, Mr. Thielman has given me some stuff, and uh, Susanna Oswedo has given me some stuff from the mm -hmm. search that was done in 2005. Mm -hmm. And so I will have a packet to share with people for just to help us mm -hmm. you know with this process. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sukman was involved with that, so oh yeah, yeah, I was probably sure remember it well. But you may, but well, yeah. but but they're very very comprehensive documents. It's helpful Great. to look at. So, Great. so I'll share that with everyone. I 2005 search was exemplary. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? Great. Unanimous. And then finally, to uh, have Mr. Schlippen and myself serve on the AEA negotiation so subcommittee. Moved. Second. Any discussion? All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Any opposed or abstentions? Unanimous. Great. Thank you. Uh, now we have some reappointments. 
Uh, so we have some existing members of the Arlington Human Rights Commission and the Rainbow Commission who have uh, agreed to continue to serve. Um, so do you want to do anything else you want to add, Ms. Seuss? Or? Uh, just that I, I reached out, uh, we were supposed to do this in spring, but we sort of ran out of time. Um, I reached out to each of these members, had a brief conversation, and they are all excited to continue. So I'd like to recommend their appointment. Yes, the um, select board does this as a consent agenda item, but we, we haven't really had that practice, so I just put it as a separate item. Um, I think we will need a motion for uh, to do that. Mr. Mr. Steelman? So, so I move that uh, we, we reappoint Christine Carney, Sharon Grossman, and Nick Minton, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Minton, yes. yeah to the Human no, Rights Minton, Commission. Minton, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Anna Watson to the uh, Rainbow Coalition. Yeah. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Any opposed or abstentions? Great. So we should send them notices. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, subcommittee and liaison reports. Budget. Okay. Budget. Budget has nothing to report, but we'll be meeting soon. Um, can you two tell me what your schedule is so that I can yeah, set up Yeah, just give us the times sure. of the weeks you're looking at. Uh, policies and procedures. Uh, we received correspondence from uh, Dr. Seuss uh, asking questions about some of the newly adopted policies. So I guess we'll, uh, that'll be on the agenda next when next we meet. Thank you. Uh, oops, I lost the page. Who's next? Uh, curriculum instruction and assessment accountability. Ms. Nothing Morgan. to report. Okay. Community relations, Ms. Seuss. Uh, yes, we had a meeting on late August. Um, we had a discussion on the Arlington Human Rights Committee documents that we've been working on for two years. Um, the school committee made some suggestions that those suggestions are back with them. They're meeting soon. I hope to bring them to, to us uh, next meeting. So, um, and we'll, I'll fill in a lot more detail when, when we do. Um, we also had some parents, we had a, a, so I met with a superintendent committee um, this summer with some after school programs. Um, it, they were very uh, cooperative, um, understood the frustration that the community has. These are, I met with the in school programs that are not under district control. So these are the private programs that are not under district control. Um, they were, they understood the community frustration about uh, different deadlines, different processes across schools, and uh, came, we came to an agreement that, that, that there would be a common calendar and that there would be common procedures for applications um, and a common sort of approach to dealing with the waiting list. So that was great. Um, we also had some parents, so come to us and express frustration about um, the programs being too small, uh, communication still being poor. Um, there are some uh, decisions that have been made by a town program, Arlington Rec, um, about busing that they were upset with, which isn't really under our purview, but there was a, some discussion about that. Um, so just to say that this is still very much a concern for the community. Um, this is not something that we are done with, that we have still have a lot of discussion to do. Um, and that we, um, we've made some progress. We've made some progress on the easy things and we need to go back and really grapple with the harder problems. Um, so that was, what else did we do? Um, there was a very brief discussion on uh, the buffer zones, just sort of the understanding of the process that, that we were sort of beginning, uh, that the superintendent and her team were beginning to look at, at buffer zone and issues that will then be brought to some committee but maybe may community rights, maybe someone else, um, uh, then brought out to the community over the course of this year. That, does that sound right to, to then be potentially, the, 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 the understanding I got, and, and we can correct, is that there won't be any changes for the 2021 school year that we're really looking out farther to the 21-22 school year. But it is a pressing problem to look at. Um, and I think that's it that we really, we didn't get to some things on the agenda. Uh, facilities? Uh, first meeting of the year will be on September 18th, 6 p.m. in this room. Okay. Uh, legal services? Nothing at this time. Active. Arlington High School Building Committee, anything else? 
uh, so it's not listed, but the calendar committee. Oh, yeah. I, I, actually, I was going to report that out in a different place. But okay. <laughs> um, they, we had a meeting, uh, what was it, Tuesday? Is that no. Tuesday? Yeah. Um, so uh, the calendar committee, which is a superintendent committee, though I'm sort of the school committee person on that, um, has decided to focus this year only on the question of religious holidays. So um, they could have discussed the uh, Labor Day issue um, with the timing of the contract with teachers that doesn't really make sense to discuss this year. And so, um, so the focus is going to be on uh, religious holidays. And the question really is whether we need to add holidays to reflect the diversity of our community or whether we should uh, remove holidays and how to and if we, that's a decision how to do that in a way that makes it very clear to the to the community and to, to teachers um, the importance of these holidays for our community and, and how that gets respected and honored so there's going to be a forum in probably uh, late october early november um, where we want to hear from as many people as possible before any recommendation is made to the school committee there will be a recommendation coming back to the school committee, I'm thinking December, around that time. Yeah. Great, thank you. Liaison reports, anybody? Announcements, Mr. Hayner. Please stop by the Rotary booth on town day to purchase a flag for your hero. These flags will be on display in front of the high school from October 24th to November 12th. Last year at the high school for a while. Right. All right, any future agenda items? Uh, do we have executive session? <laughs> All right. Yes, Mr. Hainer. Move to adjourn. Yeah, great. <laughs> second. 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 All those in favor? Aye. Yes. We're adjourned. Thank you.